<laughs> That's very good. That's exactly on the mark for what we're about to do. My favorite subject of all time, so to speak. Ronald Mallet, Professor Ronald Mallet, Ph.D. indeed, a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Connecticut. He is also a member of both the American Physical Society and the National Society of Black Physicists. He has a B.S., M.S., and Ph.D. in physics from Pennsylvania State University. The oldest of four children, Ron's life changed forever when his beloved father died of a heart attack. The 10-year-old, he was only 10, was overwhelmed with grief until he read a copy of The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. He was determined to make Wells' fantasy a reality by going back in time to see his father. Remarkably, not only did the boy from the Bronx stick with the vision, becoming one of the country's few African-American PhDs in theoretical physics, but Mallet has, according to many peers in the field, developed new theories relating to Einstein's general theory of relativity uh, that plausibly argue for the existence of time travel into the past. In addition, Ron's time travel research has been featured in an hour-long TV special on the Learning Channel, the world's first time machine. Now, if you go to coasttocoastam.com right now under featured article right at the very top, you will see time travel graphic. Professor Ron Mallett shares a graphic that basically shows the principles behind his time travel theory. View it here. You're going to want to click on that. Uh, because we're going to have the professor kind of uh, explain this as we go along. So in a moment, Professor Ronald Mallett. Professor Ronald Mallett, welcome to the program. Thank you, Art. It's good to have you here. I, I should warn you, though, Professor, I've had uh, over now many, many years a number of people on the subject of time travel that uh, have said they have done time travel or have a, an active ready machine, and honest to God, this is not a program promo kind of deal or anything else. These people have disappeared. They're gone. <laughs> uh, every single last one of them, they're just gone. And uh, so I'm not saying that, uh, that they're gone in time, but it's almost like they are. They might as well be. They're the only people have, who have virtually disappeared. So I guess there is uh, – I guess we'll get to that as we talk about time travel. And the first obvious question is – is time travel, is it really possible? Yes, Art, it really is. And um, most people don't realize that. I mean, they think of time travel as being science fiction, but um, it is, in fact, science fact, and it has been done. It's important to realize, though, that it's based on Einstein's theories of relativity. And uh, I would be highly suspect of uh, any time travel developments that warrant, but those based on Einstein's theory are sound. Um, does, now, I'm a neophyte here in a lot of ways. Does I, doesn't, I thought Einstein basically said that time travel was not possible. Oh, no, quite the opposite. In fact, in uh, old physics, the physics, so-called physics of Newton that we're familiar with, with, uh, you know, everyday world, says that time is absolute. It doesn't change. Nothing can change it. But in Einstein's theory, particularly his so-called special theory of relativity, Einstein showed that time is affected by motion. That is to say, a clock, the faster you move a clock, the more time slows down. And uh, this, in fact, has been demonstrated in many, many situations. And, uh, in fact, uh, one of the most famous ones that happened recently was in 1970s, uh, where if you have an atomic clock, an atomic clock is the most precise timekeeping mechanism that we have. And... Uh, what was done was two atomic clocks were synchronized, and one was kept stationary at the Naval Observatory, and another was put on an ordinary passenger jet. Mm -hmm. And this jet was flown around the world at close to the speed of sound. 
when it, the jet came back, they compared the two atomic clocks. Right. And what they found was that the atomic clock, <clears throat> excuse me, the atomic clock that was on the jet had actually slowed down compared to the clock that was stationary. This means that the clock that was on the atomic, I mean, the uh, atomic clock that was on the jet had actually slowed down because it was moving so quickly. And this by by how much, Professor? It was only about forty nanoseconds. Uh, in fact, it turns out that the faster you go, the more time slows down. And what this right. demonstrated was the principle. This means that if we were able to go sufficiently fast, and for example, um, NASA is in fact trying to develop rockets, engines that uh, can theoretically go close to the speed of light eventually. Wow. Uh, that you would find that it wouldn't just slow down by 40 nanoseconds. You could have its time slowing down by days, hours, months, years. Uh, so the fast, the closer you go to the speed of light, the more it slows down. And what, what this demonstrated with the uh, clocks on the, top, uh, the jet was the fact that time does slow down with speed. All right, but... Uh, what I've always wanted, and I sense what you definitely want, is not a fast rocket or a fast plane, but a machine that can somehow uh, achieve the same goal, yes? Oh, that's right. That's right. Well, the thing is, is that uh, what my interest, of course, was, was a time machine that could go into the past. But um, in, in a sense, even a rocket is a machine that can go into the future. I mean, one of the things that you have to realize is that if time is slowing down, that means that everyone that was um, on board that jet plane, right. their heart rate, you know, their metabolism, these are clocks. This means that all your uh, metabolic processes, all your physiological processes were slowing down. In other words, you were aging less. Sure. This means that the faster that you were going, the less that you age compared to everyone else. So, in a sense, you were able to go into the future uh, compared to everyone else was, who was stationary. So, uh, traveling on a rocket would take you into the future. But uh, if you wanted to have a device that was stationary, you could actually do it by using gravity. It turns out that... Well, here, here's an off-the-wall question, Professor. Mm -hmm. um, what about um, pilots, who, uh, pilots and air crew on, who, on a regularly scheduled basis... Uh, traverse the earth, you know, make flights from uh, the U.S. to, for example, where I am here in the Philippines, in other words, the other side of the world, and back and forth, back and forth. They're doing this all the time. Is there any collective uh, effect on people like that? Oh, it is, yes. The thing is, is that, however, uh, the collective effect is still very, very small. I mean, since we're talking about, you know, fractions of a second, it mm -hmm. would not be noticeable, but it is there, in fact, and it is a cumulative effect. For example, uh, the astronauts who were circling the Earth at very high speeds for very long Good. periods of time, Good point. Uh, they are, in a sense, the first time travelers, and the, and the cumulative effect is, uh, is there. So, yes, that, uh, that happens. But as I said, since the speeds, even going in a rocket, if you're going um, you know, 25,000 miles per hour, uh, which is very, very fast, the effect is still only fractions of a second. You would have to go quite fast in order to, uh, to see it in a, in a very noticeable amount. But yes, they, that, uh, you might say that they're time traveling every time they get into uh, uh, one of their jets. Okay, uh, the question of why you got interested in time travel I think is answered in your, in your bio. You lost your dad at 10 years of age. That really began it all? Yes, because... Uh, when he died, I mean, it devastated me, and uh, I wanted to find a way of, well, at the, at the time, I didn't have any uh, recourse except grief, and it was a little, bit, uh, a, a little bit more than a year after that he died that uh, my life was changed by uh, reading. I mean, that was one of the gifts that he left me, was this uh, uh, thirst to read and to, uh, to learn. And I came across H.G. Wells' book, The Time Machine, and that is what changed everything for me. It was sort of a turning point in my life. And uh, what I realized I, you know, as a child was that, let's suppose that I could build a time machine. Then I could go back into the past, not only see him again, but you know, warn him about his death. So it actually became an obsession with me to want to build a time machine to go back into the past to see him again. 
Boy, and, I can understand. I really can understand that. And so that drove you uh, ultimately to a Ph.D. in physics, huh? Well, yeah, not quite so quickly as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> no. Of course. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, because, um, well, uh, one of the things is, is that, uh, and I mentioned this, I've, I've written a book recently called Time Traveler that uh, has just come out. And um, one of the things I do in that book is to uh, actually tell the details of the story. The, the book is actually an, an autobiography uh, as well as uh, a, a pop science book to try to explain to people exactly what we understand about time travel. And uh, the road was uh, complicated and not quite that straight. I mean, one of the things is, sure. is that uh, I didn't have uh, anyone to guide me. And when I had this notion of building a time machine, um, I was uh, astute enough, even as a child, to realize that uh, since people saw me in a rather depressed state, that I better keep this notion of building a time machine a secret, um, because they might seriously wonder what was happening to me. And uh, I would imagine through a, a great deal of your early career, it would have, have to have been uh, kept secret. That's right. And the thing that gave me courage uh, that... Uh, it wasn't a crazy notion. It was the fact that uh, a few years after I came across H.G. Wells's book, uh, I came across a popular science book on uh, Einstein. And uh, when I read the book, uh, this was my first encounter with uh, the great genius. Uh, I read that Einstein, in fact, said that time could be changed and uh, it could be affected by motion. And, and I still thought, wow, this is wonderful. This means that since time is something that can be changed, then there is a possibility that uh, time travel is possible and what H.G. Wells was saying could happen. And so, once again, I kept it to myself, but I wanted to learn more and more about what this Einstein said. But even though I knew he was a physicist, you know, my father was um, a television uh, repairman, and my notion was just to somehow maybe use electronics as a way mm -hmm. of doing it. So right. my original direction was to actually consider electrical engineering rather than... Uh, than physics, and uh, so I, I uh, and the other thing is, is that, uh, well, you know, it's funny, but uh, physics, as it was taught uh, at the time that I was taking it in my high school, was taught by a rather person who wasn't particularly inspired teacher, and uh, so I didn't feel particularly inspired to go into physics. That may sound really surprising, but uh, that was so. Uh, however, I had some wonderful math teachers, and so the thing is, is that I, I became uh, enthralled with mathematics, and it was that way that I began to understand more and more about his uh, ideas. But we came, I was a poor family, so college was not something that was automatically in my future. And, uh, and I knew that if I was going to uh, get to college at all, I was going to have to do it in an indirect way, which I did by going into the, uh, the service, uh -huh. uh, the Air Force in particular. And uh, so that, as I said, there's, there's much more to the story than that, but those were, that was some of it. But eventually... I was led to the road to physics and realized that that was the only way that I was going to be able to do this. And um, once again, I learned more and more about Einstein's theories, and the more I learned, the more I realized that uh, not only time travel was possible, but the uh, possibility of building a time machine was there. But how All right, do that? Now, 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 let me stop you there. And sure. uh, I understand, I do understand the notion of speed and time. Right. I've, I've got that. But then what I don't understand is how a machine could even conceivably be possible. Because, of course, with a machine, you don't have the kind of motion we're talking about, whether it be a jet aircraft or something even close to the speed of light. You don't have any of that. All you've got is a machine. So, right. So obviously there's, there's something very much that I don't understand, and I'm sitting here looking at, the, at your graphic right now on the Coast website. So could you explain to me, uh, the, sort of basically, maybe so that the majority of us can understand, without the motion that we're talking about, how, right. how can you possibly imagine a machine that would accomplish it? Right. Very, very good point. And to do that, you have to go to Einstein's second theory. What most people don't realize, when they hear of Einstein's theory of relativity, they think of it as, as one theory. Einstein had actually developed two theories. The first theory, as you were pointing out, actually has to do with speed and time. 
That's the special theory of relativity. Mm-hmm. His second theory was called the general theory of relativity, and it has to do with gravity. And in that theory, Einstein said that gravity can slow down time also. In other words, the stronger you have a gravitational field, the more time can slow down. Now, let me use the example of the atomic clocks again. Let's suppose that you take uh, two atomic clocks. If you're at the surface of the Earth, because you're at the surface of the Earth and you're closer to the center of the Earth, gravity is stronger there than if you're at the top of a mountain. If you're at the top of the mountain, you're farther from the center of the Earth, and gravity is weaker at the top of right. the mountain. Okay? Right. So sure. if you take two atomic clocks, one at sea level and one at the top of a mountain, what has been found is that the clock at sea level runs slower than one at the top of the mountain. That means that, uh-huh. you see, right. The yes, oh, yes of course I do. So the, the, the gravitational uh, influence on the one close to sea level is indeed changing time. Exactly. And in fact, this has extremely important practical consequences because the GPS satellites, the clocks that are on board those satellites are so far away from the center of the Earth that they are running at a different rate than the clocks on the surface of the Earth. So computer signals actually have to be sent to, you know, keep them synchronized. So this actually, this, this aspect of Einstein's theory actually has everyday consequences for us. Now, here we come back to the notion of a machine. Now, if you're in a gravitational field, that means that if you can somehow make a stronger gravitational field locally, that will slow time down without motion. You just need to make gravity stronger. The question is, is how can you do that? Well, uh, uh, one way of doing it would be to go to uh, a place where gravity is much stronger than it is here on the surface of the Earth. By going to another planet, for example, like Jupiter, where gravity is much greater, clocks would slow down more. Um, The extreme case of, uh, of a gravitating body that would slow time down would be a black hole. A black hole is uh, just to, you know, uh, remind you, is a star that has collapsed to a point where all the light that tries to come from the star, since the gravity is so strong as the star collapses, all of the light that tries to leave the star gets pulled back to the star because gravity is pulling it back. And right. if you're standing outside, since all the light is being pulled back to the star, you see nothing. That's what you mean by a black hole. If you can't see anything, then it's a black hole there. Now, it turns out that, as I pointed out, since gravity can slow time down, if you were to take a clock or yourself close to a black hole, time would slow down so much that you could be near the black hole for, let's say, just a few hours, but yet hundreds of years could be passing everywhere else. So if you left, if you didn't go too close to the black hole, if you got near it but didn't go inside of it, you could come back away from the black hole and find out that you had only aged maybe uh, uh, hours, a few hours, but yet a hundred years had passed everywhere else. uh, Is that survivable? It's survivable if you don't cross the... Event horizon. Event horizon, exactly. If you don't cross the region where the light signals are being pulled back then, yes, you can do it. But if you pass the region where the light signals are being pulled back, then forget it. You know, you're, there's no way that you can get out of the black hole. So in a sense, a black hole could be used as a time machine, but, you know, you have to get to a black hole in order to do that. The notion is just that it's impossible to do it here on the Earth. And what I have found is that, once again, based on Einstein's theory, that you can manipulate gravity locally. And that's where light comes into this picture. It turns out that not only in Newton's theory, uh, classical theory, light does not have a gravitational effect. However, in Einstein's theory, not only does matter have a gravitational effect, but light itself can create gravity. This means that light can slow time down. Okay, that's a new one on me. I thought that uh, gravity was only a function of mass. Is that right. not correct? That, is it correct? That, that, that is correct. That is correct, but that's only half the story, and that's usually all that one finds uh, when one's reading, uh, you know, most standard books, but according to Einstein's theory, uh, not only can mass, but light itself can create gravity, okay? So, and as I said, that this is not all that well known, and, um, and of course, in, in Newton's theory, only matter can create gravity. 
So you might say the key to my discovery is There's that light. aspect of Einstein's theory, that light can create gravity, so the light can affect time. That's light one can, all right, hold it right there, Professor. We're at a break point, um, so just relax for a few minutes. I mean, isn't that fascinating? Light can create gravity. Now, I wonder how you would set about proving that point. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of light that comes from our stars, so some sort of measurement uh, with regard to the sun seems to me ought to prove it. Maybe. I'm Art Bell. This is Coast to Coast AM on Time Travel. Professor Ronald Mallet is my guest, the subject, my favorite time travel. Listen, if you go to the, um, the website, coasttocoastam.com, you'll see a graphic. This graphic is really fascinating, uh, particularly based on what the professor just said, that light can affect time. If that's true, then reading the graphic, ha-ha, at the top of the graphic it says you will see a loop, and inside the loop there's a light beam. Time is warped into a loop, it says. Then, down below that, what was time outside of the circle of light is now space, so he can walk, meaning our time traveler, he can walk into our past. And then down at the bottom, if he walks out of the loop, he may see himself waiting to go in. <laughs> That's kind of eerie stuff. So we're, we are talking about, in fact, time travel, uh, courtesy of light, and this is backed by uh, Einstein, Einstein's general theory of relativity. So in a moment, we'll get back to Professor Ronald Mallet. Go to the graphic and take a look. I'm Art Bell. Well, all right, Professor. Uh, let's see. Where were we? Uh, we were talking about light, and you were saying that light can affect time. Is there any way? Is there any way to prove that? Right. Well, there is. In fact, um, and this is one of the things that I mentioned in my uh, my book, Time Traveler, is the fact that you can, because of the fact that since light has energy, and um, remember the famous equals mc square. Uh -huh. That means that you can consider that if light has energy, it has almost like a mass sort of equivalent. And since mass can create gravity, then the energy of light, even though light doesn't have mass, it can create gravity too. And you could do, if you have a strong enough light beam, you could actually show that time is slowing down. And what my idea is, is to actually not use a single, is to use a, a light beam, but not just simply have it, uh, moving in a single direction, but to create a circulating light beam. And you might say, you know, how do you create a circulating light beam, and what does this do? Uh, you can actually create it uh, a number of different ways. Uh, you could actually set up a series of mirrors and have a light beam. Uh, if you think of, uh, of a square, say, and you have four mirrors at each corner of the square, right. then you could actually have a light beam coming from one of the mirrors, hitting each mirror at each corner, and going around the square that would create a circulating beam of light. And what this light does is one of the things that we haven't talked about is uh, what gravity is in Einstein's theory. Uh, we think of gravity as being something that is uh, sort of a pull of one object on another. In other words, the sun pulls on the earth or the right. earth pulls on us. But what you have to remember in Einstein's theory is that that pull of gravity is actually something of an illusion, that in Einstein's theory, uh, gravity is actually a bending of space. That's something we can't see. Now, this is going to take a little bit of explanation for the, me to make clear what I mean by a bending of space. Um, let's use an example of, uh, let's say, something like a trampoline. Let's say you have a, a, a rubber sheet, a taunt rubber sheet, Right. And suppose that you take uh, a bowling ball and you put it on that rubber sheet. Now, think of the rubber sheet as representing empty space. And think of this bowling ball that you're going to put on it as representing something like the sun. Now, if you put the bowling ball on the rubber sheet, it's going to cause the rubber sheet to bend, right? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Now, suppose that you took a little marble and you were to set it on the rubber sheet somewhere 
some point away from the bowling ball, what's going to happen? It's going, to run, it's going to run right down toward the bowling ball. Exactly. Now, suppose that the rubber sheet that's there, suppose it's transparent. So it's there, but you can't see it anymore, all right? Right, right. So all you can see now is the bowling ball and the marble. So what would you think then when you have the marble there as it's rolling towards the bowling ball? You would think that somehow the bowling ball is pulling on the marble because you can't see the, the rubber sheet anymore, right? You certainly would, yes. Exactly. Well, that is the basis of Einstein's great discovery about gravity. What he said is that the sun is curving the empty uh-huh. space around uh-huh. it. Uh-huh. I just got it. Okay? <laughs> and yes. the Earth is just simply like that marble that is moving around the curvature that's created. And it looks to us like it's a pull of the sun on the earth, but it isn't. It's actually the sun bending the empty space around it, and the earth is just moving in that that, uh, bent space. Got it. You're actually the first person who's been able to explain that to me in a way I can understand. I'm sure a lot of the audience just got it as well. Huh. Thank you. (laughs) And, but that's the point. The thing is, is that what matter can do is actually bend space and light can do the same thing. Light can actually cause space to bend, okay? Now, in Einstein's theory, not only does space get affected, but time gets affected by matter. Now, the bending of time, space and time in Einstein's theory are linked to each other. In other words, whatever you do to space, it affects time. Now, you might say, how does this bending of time look? Well, this bending of time looks to us like what we call the slowing down of a clock. In other words, the way in which we see the bending of time is that a clock slows down. So whenever you were, t- I was talking about here on the Earth, the Earth is actually curving the space around it, and we here on the Earth, even though we can't see it, that's what keeps us to the surface of the Earth. The More like the marbles. Right, exactly. And the bending of time that results from that bending of space is the slowing down of the atomic clock. Now, coming once again back to light, Light will also cause space to become bent. But if you have a circulating light beam, like this bouncing of light around the mirrors I was telling you about, this will actually cause a twisting of space. Now, how can you imagine what this twisting of space would look like? Well, imagine that you have a cup of coffee sitting in front of you, okay? Mm -hmm. And think of the coffee in your cup as being empty space. And think of of your spoon. Suppose you take your spoon and think of your spoon as being like the circulating light beam, this light beam that's going around from mirror to mirror, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you take your spoon and stir your coffee, what happens to your coffee? Your coffee starts swirling around, right, creating a little vortex. Well, that's what the circulating light beam will do. The circulating light beam will actually cause a a stirring of empty space. In other words, a, a sort of a vortex of space. It's like swirling of water down the drain of your sink. But you can't see it. So you might say, well, if I can't see it, how do I know it's there? Well, in the case of the coffee, if you put a little sugar cube into the coffee, all right, as the coffee's swirling around, it'll move the sugar cube around, right? Yes, of course. In the case of the empty space, what I have proposed is that if you take a little particle that's called a neutron, okay, this is a subatomic particle. It's part of the atom. And if you stick it in the empty space, it turns out that this neutron will actually get twisted around in the empty space. So you'll be able to see that the space is being twisted by looking at what happens to the neutron. A neutron, if you put it in the space, as the circulating light is going around. Mm -hmm. So So you you, would actually be able to see the the motion that you were desiring. Exactly. Now, once again, remember what I said about space and time being linked in Einstein's theory. Whatever happens to space happens to time. And what my calculations showed, once again, anchored in Einstein's theory, is that not only does space get twisted, but eventually, if you cause the twisting to be strong enough, time will get twisted into a loop as well. Now, what does this mean? Unconsciously, all of us are moving along a timeline, a straight line from the past to the present to the future. In other words, uh, to give you an example, suppose that you took a piece of paper and you put a straight line on the piece of paper. And on the line, this line is going to represent time. And at the bottom of the line, you're going to put yesterday, the past. 
At the middle of the line, you're going to put today, the present. And at the top of the line, you're going to put the future, tomorrow. Okay? Right, right. All of us in our lives move along this timeline from yesterday to today to tomorrow. Now, imagine that you took this piece of paper with a line on it, and you curved it into a circle, into a loop, and you connected the top part of the line with the bottom of the line. Okay? Right. Now, you're on this loop. You can move from the past along the line to the present. You can continue along the line to the future, but remember now, you've taken this straight line and made it into a circle. That means you can actually move along this line from the future back to the past. Got it. So by twisting space into a loop, you can actually travel back into the past. And that's the core of my discovery, that two parts of my discovery, that circulating light will cause a twisting of space and ultimately a twisting of time. And along those, <sighs> that twist of time, you could go back into the past. Wow. All right, in, in your graphic, uh, that's, that's really fascinating. In your graphic... You suggest um, that you might well, as you walk out of this, uh, see yourself waiting to go in. Now, wouldn't that be a classic, immediate paradox? It would appear, but it isn't. One of the things that you have to realize is that once you turn the device on, you've created new conditions. <clears throat> and this is what allows you to go back into the past, is the fact that you're doing this. And one of the ways, but it, it's complicated in the sense that you now have a new situation that you've created. And right. Oh, you have a new situation is correct. So I, I, said, I said paradox. Now, what I'm wondering is um, it, it seems impossible to us that two, two of us uh, could exist in the same space at the same time. And uh, it's almost as though one of the two would have to cease to exist, or you suggest no. So what would the condition be as you walked out? Would, would, uh, would you see each other, or would that be impossible, uh, even though you're both there? No, you um, would see each other. You and would you see to, each other. Right, and you have to realize that, that you're not the same. One is the older version of you. You are not uh -huh. identical, okay? okay? You're actually seeing, you, so, so number one, you're not the same person. You're actually a different person. You're an older person. So the person that you would be seeing coming out of the machine would be an older version of yourself. And mm -hmm. you would be seeing, as you were coming out of the machine, a younger version of yourself. And you're not occupying the same space. You're actually uh, at the same time, but you're actually occupying two different, you know, regions of space. The other thing is, is that there's another aspect to this because, as you clearly pointed out, this seems like this was going. This is could lead to paradoxes, and you have to realize that that aspect of the theory, you have to consider another important theory of physics to uh, to consider what might happen in that particular case. And this other theory is as strange in itself as relativity is, and it's the other pillar of 20th century physics, and it's called quantum theory. And it's quantum theory that tells us how this apparent paradox is associated with time travel in the past could be resolved. And um, it leads to an idea that is as weird as time travel. It's called the notion of parallel universes. Mm -hmm. And But once again, what's important to realize is that this is anchored in quantum theory. So... And quantum theory, even though it, the name theory is there, it's, uh, quantum theory is the basis that we can understand everything from the atom to uh, cell phones. In other words, our cell phones wouldn't work if, quantum, if there wasn't quantum theory. So it tells us exactly how matter operates. Uh, now, the thing is, is that what quantum theory tells us also is that the world at the atomic level operates in a way that... Um, we're not used to seeing on everyday life. Uh, things can change, change their identities. Uh, particles can merge into each other. Things, things that can happen that we don't see on an everyday level. And also what quantum theory tells us is that, you know, we're used to the notion that uh, if we toss an object across the room, we can exactly tell where it's going to go when we toss it across the room. In quantum theory, the best that we could do is to say, 
where it might go. We can't talk about how things will exactly happen. We can only talk about what will probably happen next. Right, right. And to, uh, to give you a very specific example of what quantum theory would imply if you apply it to everyday life, and um, this is anchored in a theory that was developed by a man named Hugh Everett, who was uh, a physicist who tried to apply, who applied uh, quantum theory to the entire universe. Uh, suppose that um, at uh, lunch tomorrow you were trying to make up your mind to have uh, a fish sandwich or a cheeseburger. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, at the very moment that you made the decision that you decided to choose one, there is a split in the universe. There are two separate universes that would diverge from each other. There would be an art bell that would be in a universe that has chosen the fish sandwich, but there would also be an art bell in a whole new universe that has the cheeseburger. They would not know of each other. They would be two separate paths, two parallel different universes, all self-contained. And this would happen for every single decision that you and everyone makes. There would be a split in the universe at that particular point. And it doesn't have to do with, with human beings. This could happen even at, uh, for an electron. In other words, if an electron has a possibility of going in one direction or another, then it chooses one path in one universe and it chooses the other path in a separate universe. That's the basis of what's known as parallel universe theory. That, that suggests um, an absolute unlimited number of universes, right? Absolutely, exactly. It, it, for every possible alternative, there is a separate universe. And all of these universes are happening in different spaces. The space is technically called a superspace where all these universes are happening. So there can be an unlimited number of them because they're not crowding each other. Uh, now, the thing is, is that how does this apply to time travel? Well, if you, and this was actually studied by a physicist at Oxford University, David Deutsch, uh, looking at how quantum theory would, have, would affect this, these paradoxes. Suppose that you went back into the past. As soon as you arrive in the past, there would be a split in the universe. There would be two universes. You, for example, would be find yourself emerging in a universe in which you could actually see yourself going into the machine. But there would be another universe in which you don't see that. Okay, so there are actually two separate universes. Now, the new universe, in other words, this, this gets around this so-called notion of the grandfather paradox, where you go back and... Uh, kill your grandfather. Kill your grandfather, or the, or the way that I, I like to think of it, the more milder form is you go back and prevent your grandfather from getting married, for example. There and, you, you know, and if, if he doesn't get married, then he doesn't have your, you know, your father or mother, and they don't have you, so, you know, you shouldn't be around. That's but right. if, if you go back into the past, what the parallel universe theory says is that as soon as you arrive in the past, there would be a split. There would be a universe in which you, in fact, would be in a, a universe where you would have to see your grandfather and you could prevent his marriage. You would now find yourself in a very strange universe in which you were never born, but you were there. But the other universe, you would not have you emerging and affecting your grandfather. And that universe does give rise to you. The notion here is, is that you can go back into the past and change the past, but the past you change is not the past that you came from. The past you change is not the past you came from. That's right. So, so from that moment of change forward, everything would be different. That's right. There would, but there would be another universe that led to the normal path that you came from. Okay. In other words, that's the reason why there wouldn't be a, a, a paradox, because there would be a universe that in which you didn't affect your grandfather, and he did get married, in fact, you know, he doesn't even encounter you, and, and things go normally. And that's the universe that you came from. But as soon as you entered the time machine and came back into the past, you ended up in a different universe, and that's the universe that you can affect. So you, you can go back into the past and change things, but the things you're changing are in a new universe. Um, there's this uh, butterfly effect thing. Now, if you create a change... You're in another universe in which uh, events unfold in a, in a possibly a completely different way 
Now, maybe the change that you make has some large effect on the unfolding of events in this new universe, or maybe it it does not. Is that is that correct? That's that's right. I mean, it's more likely that it will. I mean, if you uh, emerge and you change things, it's likely that the ripple effect is going to have very, very significant changes in that new universe. Really? Yes. Because, you know, every little thing that you do uh, it can lead to a change that it can be extremely dramatic. My God, we're already at another break point. Uh, this time is just flying by. All right, Professor, hold tight. Professor Ronald Mallet is my guest, and if you want to look at a model of a time machine, we've got a um, coast to coast dot com right now. I suggest you take a very good look as you listen. I'm not sure I believe in time either. As a straight, unbendable, unchangeable. Uh, line that simply goes from the past to the present that we chug along in toward the future. I, I don't believe it's that single line. I really do think the professor is right, Professor Ronald Mallet, that uh, it can be modified from a straight line to essentially a circle that would allow travel, easy travel from the future into the past, zipping past the present, again into the future, as you wish to do, traveling probably in either uh, direction. And I wonder what would control the direction of the travel. That, that would, in itself, is an interesting... There's a million interesting questions here. Professor Ronald Mallet, my guest, time travel is a subject. We'll be right back. <laughs> Once again, Professor Ronald Mallet. Uh, Professor, if you could travel into the past, could you... Um, well, here's a question from a listener. Uh, Josie in Toledo, Ohio says, Art, if you could go back in time and try and, and you change something and then end up in a different universe, then doesn't that defeat the purpose of going back in time, trying to change something in the first place? Well, I would answer that as no, because you're in a different universe then where... Things unfold in a very different way. And now how that would relate, for example, to your father. Let's say you went back in time, Professor, and you did something that prevented his death. Could you stay then in that timeline, in that universe, and continue... Um, I don't know, wait a minute, let me think about this. And continue to be with your father through what would be then his normal extended lifetime. Yes, it would just be that there, it would be a weird sort of thing because, in a sense, be you would be, right, you would be, exactly, you would be older and you would actually have uh, a younger version of yourself in that universe. You would have sacrificed yourself in your old universe because uh, it, you would essentially no longer be a participant there. And that would be the sacrifice that you would have to make. In other words, I would now be in a universe in which my father would continue to live. It would be strange because he would be a younger man than myself, and uh, he would live normally, and uh, the version of me, the younger version of me in that universe would, would live out a different life. I might act as an older uncle for him or something like that, or, you know, uh, but uh, a godfather or something. But uh, the thing is, is that it would be, I would be able to see how his life would have evolved uh, if things had been changed. But, but from our again, point of view, sacrifice. yes, but from our point of view, uh, you would disappear. That's right. You would be gone forever from the time stream that you had been in. And uh, you would just, that would be it. People would say, well, you know, he's gone. So, but yeah. once again, so you, you in a sense, um, you know, for example, if, if I were able to prevent the assassination of Martin Luther King, I could find, do it in another universe, and that would, but I would have sacrificed myself in my original universe. I've got it. Um, all right. Uh, I once had a, a guest, um, an interesting young guy, who was using a, a laser uh, and found that he could take things like uh, a little nut or a bolt um, 
and caused them to uh, temporarily disappear and then reappear. He was using, uh, I, I can't recall exactly what it was, a laser. He actually got in trouble for stealing some uh, very large transformers. And so he was using magnetics and and a laser, you know, which is, is light in some manner. And I can't, can't recall exactly what it was. Um, but he's one of those that is now gone. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that he's traveled in time, but... Perhaps he has. And is it possible, in your view, Professor, that there are some people, aside from yourself, that have stumbled into exactly what you're talking about here and have simply gone to another time? No. The thing is, is that it's, you have to remember that there's a, there's a number of things that are involved here. Number one is the fact that uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you know this person did. Uh, laser light is just like light, but it's only much more focused, it's much more intense, and it, um, it can be, it's, it has properties that, that ordinary light from a light bulb doesn't share. But one of the things that it can't do is just simply make things disappear, at least not so far as I know in the normal laws of physics. It can be used to push things around, and it can be used to create, uh, you know, gravitational fields. But one of the other things you have to realize, and this is one of those things that people sometimes ask, you know, um, are there time travelers among us? And has, have, you know, would that... Well, the obvious question, uh, obvious question, if, if time travel is to ever be possible, then where are the time travelers? Somebody famous said that, right. Exactly. That's, that's a very famous question, in fact, one that was asked by Stephen Hawking. The thing that you have to realize is with real time travel... It requires a mechanism. Then if you turn, for example, the sort of system that I was talking about, the circulating light beam, well, suppose I turned it on today. Yes. And I left it on for, um, let's say, 10 years. Then continuously, then someone could send information back from 10 years from now, back five years, all the way back to the time the machine was turned on, but they can't go back earlier than that particular point. So, for example, and this makes sense, if, if you talk of think of your radio, you don't get something from your radio before you turn it on, okay? You can't have a physical effect occurring before its cause is there. In other words, there will not be time travelers until time travel is invented. Exactly. So that's the answer to that question. The answer to that question is, is that the reason why we have not been inundated with time travelers is that the first time machine has not, in fact, been invented. To the best of our knowledge. To the best of our knowledge, exactly. The thing is, is that it is possible that it has been developed in other worlds. Uh, that's distinctly a possibility. I believe that life is out there in other civilizations. Uh, that's distinct from the notion that uh, they may have visited us. Uh, but, Professor, if you had a time machine, if you went back to prior to your father's death, you, uh, just kind of like early in your career, you couldn't really talk about it, could you? Well, uh, you mean if I went back to, oh, yes. You mean, well, that's an interesting point. What would I do? I mean, once I was there, what, what uh, issues? I mean, that, that's, that brings up a whole host of other things that, you know, how much would I want to become involved in that world uh, once I got there? That's something that I would have to decide, you know, after really careful consideration, because there are these ethical questions about... Could you make a choice, Professor? Could you stay in the past oh, and yeah. have your life there, or could you also... Uh, and also, could you choose to return? Could you return? No. Once you are in that new universe, you cannot uh. return to the old universe. You are in that universe forever. And if you use the machine again, you would end up in a new universe. So in a sense, you would be parallel universe hopping as well as time traveling. Now, I, yeah, I have to say that, remember, you've got to, this par notion of parallel universes is just one possible alternative that's based in the physics of quantum mechanics. There are other possibilities that one has to consider as far as time travel is concerned because, you know, you have to realize that all that we really have for ourselves is the present moment, the moment that we're in. The future is not something that has happened.
So suppose that you receive some sort of information from somewhere today. Uh, let's say that the information said, you know, Art, I don't think it's going to be a good idea for you to take a drive tomorrow. That's mm-hmm. you know, all the information you got, okay? Right. Now, you would have to ask yourself, wait a minute. Now, is this a message from someone, you know, who knows something that I don't know about, you know, what's going to happen in my car? In other words, someone who just, you know, knows that someone tampered with it? Or is this information coming from the future in which someone knows that something's going to happen to me if I take that drive? Or is someone, you know, um, playing a joke on me? See, Mm -hmm. so there's a fundamental uncertainty that you have in that information that you've received. Where is it coming from? Now, you, you have to make a decision and act on it or not act on it. That's always going to be confronting people when time travel occurs. When they get the information, they're going to have to decide, is this information from my universe or parallel universe? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but you're, you're, you're telling me it's a one-way ticket. That's right. Okay, a one-way ticket. So that, that in itself would create a very, very difficult uh, decision, Professor. Uh, let's say that you built the machine that you have pictured here, that you actually managed to build it. How much hesitation would you have uh, in in <laughs> in going in and taking a you know taking a shot? Not I mean, none. None. Excuse me. <clears throat> that, that's quite all right. No, the thing is, is that I wouldn't have no hesitation at all because of the thing. It's you know, there's this excitement about knowing more of exploring the unknown, and you know, I am one of these people. I'm, Star Trek fan, and this notion of gold, boldly going where no one has gone before oh, would yes. be irresistible. I mean, I would want to know what it would be like to uh, to time travel, so I would have no hesitation to uh, to do it. The well, since of, it's a one-shot deal, uh, since it is a one-shot deal, of course, you would take back with you uh, the knowledge to build another machine, I suppose, if you had to, if, if the technology was available at whatever time you chose, a million questions. What would you choose? If, if you had the machine, you could go to the future, you could go to the past, but it's a one way ticket. Basically, where would you go? Have you made that decision? No, I mean, I haven't. I mean, for me, right at this particular point, it's just to, uh, See that my equations would, in fact, lead to these effects, and to actually do it. It's right. the, the notion of uh, the sweetness of the technology of, of knowing, you know, that we have understood some really fundamental new aspect about the physical world. That's the thing that that would motivate me to uh, to do it. You know, this question of of what to do with it is actually a very important ethical consideration because you know the notion of time travel leads to the notion of time travel abuses. Um, any new technology has that associated with it. And the question is, is that if you have this new technology, um, don't you have to worry about how it might be abused? And no I wonder, doubt. What, what abuses do you imagine? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> imagine what time travel would be like in the hands of terrorists. I mean, um, <sighs> you see what I'm getting at? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So the thing is, is that one has to be careful about that sort of thing. And so I believe that once the technology is developed, it, like any technology, it has to be regulated. That doesn't mean that the technology should be prevented, because also there's the positive aspect of the technology. In other words, time travel could be used as an early warning device to tell us of, of disasters, preventing you know catastrophes. So the thing is, is that like any other technology, it's going to require regulation, and there will have to be sort of a, a time travel commission that would oversee uh, the ethics of using the machine, the considerations that would be evolved, and uh, of monitoring uh, possible abuses. One of my favorite movies is uh, called Time Cop, and uh, the, the title of the movie is, is uh, you know, doesn't do justice to the content. I thought that the movie was actually quite good with Claude Van Damme, but the notion was is that they had a, a time regulation uh, commission that essentially monitored uh, abuses in time travel, and that is something that will eventually have to happen. Well, but... but... According to what I, if I've been listening correctly, uh, not much that you would go back and do would affect the 
the, the present universe's timeline, would it? Well, see, that's what I was getting at. In other words, if you think of time travel and think of the notion of that all you have is the present moment, then that means you really can have the possibility of affecting the future. Now, it sounds weird in the sense that, you know, what happened to that future out there? Did it just simply disappear? Perhaps. In other words, there may not be a parallel universe. You may, in fact, since all you're dealing with is here and now, you may, in fact, be changing and creating a whole new future. And there is no other future except for the future that you have evolved from from this particular point. Not a parallel one, but a new one. So it all depends on whether this parallel universe theory is, is correct or not. Exactly. And that's something that we won't know until we begin time traveling. Well, there wouldn't be any danger in time travel as long as we've got infinite parallel universes. But if, 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 if time travel would only allow us to tamper with what we're living in now, then all of those ethical questions would be gigantic. Exactly. And the thing that uh, you have to realize is that, see, one of the aspects of Einstein's theory is, is that we think we are all in sync and in the same, marching along at the same uh, time stream because we're all moving at about the same speed and we all find ourselves in about the, a gravitational field that's about the same strength. Mm. But as soon as we start moving very, very quickly or find ourselves in gravitational fields that are very different, our time stream separates from everyone else. So we are conscious of what a future would have been like. But once we arrive at a particular point in the past, that past becomes our present. And for everyone else, there's no future that has happened yet. We are the only one who knew about a potential future that could have happened. And so we could change. Like, there's a possibility that we really could change. Professor, um, how much money would you need to construct, uh, to construct what you um, have pictured for us here? How much money would that take? I'm not sure. The thing is, is that what we're doing is in stages. I'm a theoretical physicist, by the way, and I developed the basic equations, and I'm working with a collaborator who's an experimental physicist. He's okay. an expert in lasers. And in physics, uh, there is this very, very important difference between theoretical and experimental physics. Uh, yes, of course. Right. You know, I mean, uh, in other words, Einstein uh, created equals MC square, but he did not build the atomic bomb based on mm -hmm. his equation. Okay, mm -hmm. that was done by um, other physicists and experimenters, largely. And the same thing is the case here. I've developed the basic equations, but I have an experimental collaborator who's an expert in lasers who's working with me to put to uh, put my notion into a design for... So you're telling me, you're telling me he has actually begun experimental work based on your equations? No. The thing is, is that he's begun design. Uh, what uh -huh. is holding us up is funding. Uh, that's the other thing that the public doesn't uh, realize is that, uh, you know, this is... Well, that's why I asked about money. Exactly. We don't know how much. What to, to get started, what we need to, to actually... One of the things we have to do is to show that the circulating light is going to cause a twisting of space. If we don't see that, then there's no point in going on. That's going to cost at least a quarter of a million dollars to begin, specifically. That's not, okay, well, that's not much. And uh, if you, a quarter of a million dollars, if you can show that, then uh, the rest of it is probably going to work. Is that fair? Exactly. That's precisely it. Because the space twisting is what drives the time twisting, but it requires more energy. But first, you have to see the space twisting. That's the precursor that would tell you that, that uh, you know, it will, you know, it's the basic. Uh, Professor, how much friend. energy uh, do you imagine this, this would take? Because it, when I look at this, it doesn't look like it would take the kind of energy that most theoretical physicists talk about, um, and I've interviewed a number of them on the subject of time travel, and, they, and a lot of them say, yes, we think it's possible, but it would take more energy than we're really capable of producing right now on Earth, period. Well, the thing is, is that this would require, the space twisting part requires, doesn't require as much energy. The equations show that two things have to happen. You need intensity 
And you also have to talk about how small the region of space is that you're dealing with. Huh? The smaller the region of space, the less energy you need. That's why in what we're doing, we're talking about information and subatomic particles. If you talk about sufficiently of space, then not as much energy is going to be needed. If you talk about trying to do it with human beings, an enormous amount of energy is going to be needed. All right. Uh, no, let, let's, let's back up and talk about something as long as small as a nut or a bolt or something, something small. Right. Probably then we would need, you know, the estimate trillions of watts of energy now, you might say that, that's power. Oh, that You might say, wait a minute, you know, that's huge. But it turns out that there are lasers that have energies that are uh, like right the energy in the sun. Professor, hold on. We're at another break point. We'll be right back. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Professor Ron Mallet. He is a theoretical physicist, and he thinks he's... Uh, he may well be on to what it would take to build a time machine. He's actually got a... Um, Another physicist who is prepared to begin work on the machine itself. This really is something. And if you've been listening carefully, it really, really sounds possible to me. This is very, very exciting stuff. All my life, I guess I've been looking towards something like this. Um, so many questions. Chad, for example, in uh, Fairland, Indiana, I guess it is, says, are there would be ethical considerations even if parallel unis, uh, universes exist, and uh, they probably do, you could still totally screw up somebody else's universe, and that would not be ethical. We'll ask about that in a moment. All right, Professor, welcome back. That's a really good question. Um, assuming that well, there are an infinite number of universes, even assuming that, uh, such a machine, um, if you can build it, would, in fact, even if it didn't screw up our current universe, uh, it might screw up somebody else's universe, and that in itself would be an ethical dilemma of some sort, wouldn't it? Absolutely. I mean, that, that's actually a very good point, and once again, that, that's something that has to be considered because... Um, someone may realize that they're doing that and could do it for uh, reasons that, uh, you know, are not good for a yes. new universe. Exactly. So once again, that's a reason for the necessity of regulation because, yes, uh, you could go back and you could say that, well, I don't like this universe that I'm in and I'm going to go into another universe and I'm going to manipulate their universe mm -hmm. so that it's more to my desire. And mm -hmm. yes, that's... That, would be frightening, and that would be right. something that would have to be considered. All right. That said, let's for a second imagine that you've done the initial testing and you find that everything you think is true is true, and you finally end up building the machine. Uh, and I, I don't, I'm not sure how you're going to answer this, but um, I'm, I'm wondering, even given the possibility that you would screw up somebody else's universe, there would be that point you would come to where you would either push the button or not. And, uh, you know, sci <laughs> I've wondered this about so many areas of science, Professor. Uh, it seems as though ethical dilemmas or not. Well, go back to when, for example, the atomic bomb uh, was first, when we lit off the first one. Right. There was a substantial portion of the, uh, the world that you walk in, the physics world, that thought there might be a chain reaction and we might actually uh, burn up our, our atmosphere. It might have chain reaction and destroy the world. That's right. There was that Quite. consideration. In fact, there was, the but we pushed the button. Right. <laughs> and I think that it, it's part of our human nature that we have to know. We have to know. I mean, even if you think of it in terms of uh, the Wright brothers, the plane could have crashed. They could have been killed, you know? I mean, the thing is, is that we have to know. And we... Yes, but they, they would have only um, lost and been gambling with their own personal lives. Well, that's now. true. That's true. I mean, the thing is, is that, uh, in, at least from my standpoint, I'm the notion of trying to uh, 
to send a subatomic particle back or, you know, a, a piece of information back within my laboratory, I wouldn't feel as though I was going to be uh, annihilating or, you know, destroying someone else's world. But so, that I is mean, a possibility. Well, but I don't think so. I mean, I, don't, I, think that, I think that considering what it is that I'm attempting to do within the region of what I'm looking at, uh, ultimately, uh, if we're talking about, uh, you know, the future situation, but I think within the limited laboratory situation that I'm looking at, that would not happen. The question is, is that eventually uh, – it could happen, but not in the situation that I'm looking at. I don't think that that um, seeing whether or not uh, a subatomic particle is going to live longer because it's going into a time mm-hmm. loop is going to you know uh, cause a catastrophic change in someone else's universe. But you know the thing is is that anything that we do has a consequence for our own future. And you were talking a little bit before about the butterfly effect that some yes. little effect that we do. Uh, leads to a chain of events that can alter things in a very, very dramatic way. So even that little notion of sending um, a bit of information or a subatomic particle will alter things in some small way that will change the future. But as I said, um, if we did that, then I think we would say, maybe I shouldn't go out of my house today because if I go out, you know, uh, I may cause uh, an accident, and if I cause an accident, then, you know, uh, that could really lead to, you know, disastrous consequences for me and others. So maybe I should just stay here and not leave my house. Well, okay, but that, that applies um, to scientific work where the only thing at risk uh, was uh, perhaps an individual or even a few individuals. Science has marched forward uh, since the age of Element 92, uh, to the point where the, the the button we push might not have just an effect on 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 that one person, but on the entire world. So today's buttons and future buttons uh, are sort of different than the old buttons. Well, you're you're quite right. The thing <laughs> is, is that at least insofar as I can see from my equations, there doesn't seem to be a theoretical possibility that there would be something like the equivalent of a chain reaction that would lead to the destruction even of a parallel universe, let alone of our universe. So at least in that limited sense of what you know, I can see, it doesn't seem as though there would be that possibility. There was that possibility because you know, the hydro- there was the notion of a of, of fusion reaction that would be ignited by a fission reaction that um, could lead, have lead, led to, uh, you know. But most of the scientists didn't believe that that was so. There were a small group that did. But even in my case, there, doesn't, there isn't that equivalent here. That is to say that it doesn't seem in the equations to say that, well, there is this possibility that if I do this, it's going to, you know, alter all of reality as we know it. Okay. Well, you've written a book, Professor, uh... Uh, simply called time travel. Now, um, has it been out long enough for your colleagues, for other uh, theoretical physicists to have reviewed it? And if so, what kind of feedback have you received? Right. Well, uh, my book, uh, thank you for mentioning my book, Time Traveler. Um, in fact, Traveler. Before, right, Time Traveler is the, is, the, right, is the name of the book. And the subtitle of it is The Scientist's Personal Mission to Make Time Travel Reality. So that gives you an idea of what the content of the book is. But Time Traveler is uh, it's just coming out. I mean, the, this week is when it's, uh, its official release date, and it uh-huh. will be available this week in all bookstores, and it can be ordered on Amazon.com. So it's just getting out there. And all right. Even at that, though, Professor, I'm sure that at some earlier stage, before you went to uh, publication, you must have handed this to a few other colleagues somewhere or another and said, read this and tell me what you think. Yes, and if you would like, I can actually tell you some of their comments. I mean, Please, yes, please. Okay, I mean, the thing is, is that one of the things I, I want to point out about the book is that this book, Time Traveler, is not your standard uh, popular science book. It's actually an autobiography and which talks about my journey, and then it also discusses the different possibilities of time travel, just not just my theory, but the theory of 
the possibilities of time travel using wormholes and cosmic strings and uh, uh -huh. you know as well as the theory of black holes and everything but but the base, the book is basically a story an autobiography with the science in it so uh, a lot of the comments actually have to do with that so you have to realize that one of the things I was trying to do uh, for example uh, Christine Larson, is a professor of physics and astronomy at Central Connecticut State University, mm -hmm. uh, said that uh, she thought that the book was uh, a powerful text that paints the scientist as first and foremost a human being uh, in a way that few other scientific autobiographies have managed. The science enthusiast who comes to this work will be fascinated by Mallet's groundbreaking research into time travel and will come away with an unexpected understanding of his struggles against prejudice, both societal and scientific. So, uh, you know, I, you hadn't mentioned it, but I am African-American, and that has actually been part of the journey as well. I mean, it's this, this story is that broad. Um, and another has, has that been, has that been uh, difficult for you? I mean, in your field, is the fact that you're African-American, has that, has that been a difficult path to follow? I thought we were past all that, or are we not? Uh, I would like to say so, but unfortunately, one of the uh, major physicists in my field as I was growing up as a young scientist, um, who was a Nobel Prize winner, his name is uh, William Shockley, very well mm -hmm. known. He actually was uh, uh, co-inventor of the transistor, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he believed specifically that um, African Americans were uh, inherently uh, inferior intellectually. This is a, oh. this is a Nobel Prize winner in our time. Uh, so you you get my drift. This is a physicist, yes. okay? So yes, yes, uh, and and imagine my hearing this. I mean, I remembered hearing him. He was being interviewed um, at Yale. This was back in the uh, uh, late '60s, early it was the early '70s, and uh, uh, this is the sort of thing that he was spouting. And this is a Nobel Prize winner. And, uh, you know, th this, this whole notion of the bell curve that's been out recently, you know, which, uh, you know, now young African Americans are, you know, faced with this notion that, uh, well, if, how, why should I go into the sciences? I mean, you know, I mean, in other words, they're discouraged. Just the whole notion that they may be uh, intrinsically incapable of achieving great things in the sciences, uh, this is the sort of thing that's put out, and it's put out by people like Shockley. So that's the sort of thing that, that I had to overcome in a general way. Now, I have to say that in a very personal level, I was very, very lucky. My thesis advisor was a wonderful person uh, at Penn State. My first employer at uh, United Technologies, uh, uh, was he was a wonderful man. And uh, so there have been people in my life who have uh, aided me and who have helped me. But the general atmosphere, uh, for example, just to give you a notion, when I got my Ph.D. in uh, physics in 1973, there were 20,000 Ph.D. physicists in the United States. Of those 20,000, only 79 were African American. I was one of the 79. My God. You see my uh, point? So the whole propagated notion um, actually has brought about the reality of, um, I guess, telling the African-American community that they can't do it. It, it. And so it must have, to some degree, uh, worked. In other words, it's kept people out of the field. Exactly. You know, why bother? And one of the things that has been important for me with this, this book, Time Traveler, has been to try to... And, and, I've, and I've been very, very fortunate to be able to give lectures across the country, and um, African-American groups have invited me, as well as the, the larger community, is to eradicate that notion, to encourage uh, young people that African-American, that they are capable of achieving great things in sciences, and there is no limit. And, uh, Gee, maybe, maybe you'd rather go into the future where this crap has ended. <laughs> well, huh. uh, that's the thing that I'm hoping that, that I feel like I am doing is by changing the present, I, I'm hoping to be able to alter uh, one of the possible futures. And uh, it's, it's sometimes very, very discouraging, 
uh, it, it's not it's not easy. Uh, I mean, the, the the heroes that are always put up within the African American community, and they are heroes or are, are, uh, athletes, you know, and entertainers, and that's fine. But uh, you know, our society is a highly technological society, and I believe that it should be contributed to by everyone, women, you know, uh, minorities. I mean, everyone needs to contribute to this increasingly sophisticated civilization. And I think that the only thing that inhibits people is the barriers that they put up to themselves, but they sometimes allow society to tell them what they can't do. And that's one of the things that I want to fight. And that's one of the things that, that I try to point out in my book, too. If you actually, if you actually got this machine uh, built, and you, you had a working model, Professor, would you, would you turn it over to the world, or would you, given the opportunity, walk in and disappear I would, I would actually turn it over to the world. I, I'm one of these people who actually believe that uh, we can be responsible for ourselves if we're given, you know, the chance. I would not just simply disappear. I want to be uh, someone who makes a difference in our society, and I believe that time travel could allow us to control our destiny in a way that previously we had not been able to. And but that, even 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 if some of these ethical barriers that we sort of discussed, um, well, for example, uh, you said, what if it fell into the hands of a terrorist? Well, what if it did? And what if that terrorist somehow went back and and undid America, so that in in some in our, our future or our timeline changed, and suddenly there is no America? I mean, that's a very very serious consideration. Oh, that's a very serious consideration. But the thing is, is that. Blocking time travel research uh, in a free society is not going to block time travel research in a totalitarian society. Um, sure. Scientific knowledge is not just the province of free societies, and by our not allowing ourselves to be aware of and you know and have some control of the situation could lead to the disastrous consequences anyway. Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, so there'd be a, a time travel gap, and the other guys, the bad guys, would get it, and there would go America anyway. So we would have to, there'd be a time travel race. Once any part of what you uh, theorize is correct was proven, there would be a, a, a race, wouldn't there? That's exactly so. That's exactly so. Um, have you had any interest uh well of course it's early because the book's not out and here you are on national oh, yeah, radio book, yeah the book is out i mean it's no, out, or just actually. just coming out but right, uh, my, my out. ultimate point was have you had any interest for example from darpa uh, or from uh any government agencies and if you haven't i bet you will i have already oh, oh you have <laughs> oh yeah i actually mentioned that in the book uh that yes, and it's been uh, an uncomfortable situation because I don't mind having. In fact, I need the support of the government. But there's different branches of, of the government. For instance, yeah. the National Science Foundation and NASA, and that's fine. But uh, I really will not. I don't want to have uh, this used as a military, you know, tool. And so I have avoided accepted funding that uh, could come from DARPA, and I have actually been approached with that. And the thing is, is that uh, I have avoided that. I don't, and I have also avoided funding that has come from other sources um, that aren't military that, in which they want to put uh, cap top secret. In other words, I have been approached by people who have said, uh -huh. we'll give you as much funds as you need. And they, and they, I know that they had the funds and they were serious, uh, but they said, we want you now no longer to talk about your research. And I said, no, I will not do that. Uh, I believe in open research, and I believe in, in sharing my results with society. And in fact, this book, Time Traveler, is that point, to share with the society the fruits of what not only I have done, but other, other physicists. How hard did you have to think about that offer before you said no? I, uh, <clears throat> a fraction of a second, not even that. But <laughs> the thing is, is that it's hard. Easy. Because the thing is, is that, uh, you know, one would it's think... It's money. It's money. But I believe that we will, and in fact, we have uh, the University of Connecticut has a foundation, the money 
wouldn't come directly to me. It goes to this foundation. And the, an account has, in fact, been opened by the type of person that I want. Uh, this this uh, individual is uh, uh, he's an investor, but he is also a composer. And he has said, there's no strings. Here's some money. And I just want to know how the, the work is going. All right. Hold tight, Professor. We will be right back. This is Coast to Coast AM. If alternative radio gets any better than this, I don't know how. My guest is Professor Ron Mallett. The subject is time travel, and his book is Time Traveler. Now, it's just about to hit the sands, as it were, and uh, Amazon.com and all the rest of the normal places will, if they don't now have it, shortly will. It's certainly something you're going to want to read. It's a book about the man, I guess the journey, and uh, maybe the machine. He's uh, got some very serious theories on how time travel actually might be achieved. And if you don't have questions after listening to all of this, well, you haven't been listening. Back in a moment with Professor Mallet. The one thing that I think we didn't cover as well as we might have was the uh, was power required. Uh, Professor, you were saying that it's a great deal of power. However, you got to kind of a however. Some of right. some current lasers and so forth are capable of the kind of power you're talking about. That's right. I mean, we have lasers that are new, used for uh, thermonuclear fusion. This is the type of uh, energy that's generated by the sun. And there are lasers that are capable of uh, reaching powers that can cause uh, that type of fusion process. So... The point is, is that uh, technology is potentially capable of doing it, uh, but what we have to do, as I said, is start. We don't need it, that kind of power at this particular level to do the type of experiment that we're doing to show the, sp- the uh, space twisting effect. But uh, ultimately, if we have to go to higher powers, and I also believe that one of the other aspects that uh, you know is just. As you are doing the experiment, you find out that there are side effects, ways that you might be able to boost the effect. In other words, mm-hmm. one of the things that, that you do when you're doing experiments is find out things that unexpectedly might help you to uh, create the conditions that might even be simpler. But once again, we need the basic funding so that we can actually just get started on the basic experiment. Well, there's always pulsing. You can get uh, tremendous uh, power with with pulsing, and if you were dealing with something as small as information, you just might have the power you need. Um, Professor, you know, when when I mentioned DARPA, that was just a shot in the dark on my part. I thought, you know, DARPA would be the kind of people that would be interested in something like that, and you're telling me they were. Yes, as a matter of fact, they they, they were. Yeah, I mean, you have to I mean, realize that this is research now that's been going on, you know, for a few years, and I, the work that I published is published in the uh, standard, you know, refereed scientific journals, uh, Physics Letters, Foundations of Physics. So the information is there, and people were aware in the uh, physics community and the other, uh, you know, the general community uh, what my research was doing. So I had been approached by... Uh, you know, Got people, it. right, and the thing is, is that, as I said, I just realized that, uh, no, I mean, I didn't realize, I mean, I, I just did not want and do not want, uh, if, if military application comes, it doesn't, it's not going to come directly from me, and and as I said, also, I have gotten uh, funding, or not funding, but people have approached me, uh, Non-government of course. Agencies. Well, imagine the military applications. It's better not to really. What What are some practical? App- Let's assume that uh, the machine is built. Time travel becomes possible. What would be some of the more positive, practical applications of time travel? Then we'll go to the phones. We're all lined up here with calls. Okay. Well, I won't be able to go into you know a lot of detail. I, I mentioned much more detail in my book, Time Traveler, but uh, I actually did a, a provisional patent on. Uh, a possibility because as as, a, as such you can't 
a patent a time machine, but you can patent a, a time machine with an application that's associated with it. And what I uh -huh. su suggested was uh, an early warning system. Uh, and the, the notion that I had was is that if you uh, wanted to know whether or not, and I used a specific example of uh, uh, a Mars mission, if you wanted to find out the success of a Mars mission, uh, uh -huh. that you would, for example, come to me and uh, I would turn on the device and give you uh, an encrypted transmitter. And in the device, the machine itself would have a transceiver associated, which would also be encrypted. But So it would only respond to a very specific signal from you. Now, the machine's turned on, and let's say it takes you two years to do the project. And suppose that you find out that it's, um, you know, successful or not. Mm -hmm. You send a signal to the machine it, at that's there in the future, two years from now. It transmits the signal back to today and tells you the consequences of that. And uh, that would save you manpower, material, you know, to know now. And one of the things that had motivated me about that notion was the tragic Columbia disaster. Yes. I mean, just think how wonderful it would have been to have known that that disaster was going to occur and then to have not have it occur. So. Do the O-ring research, and uh, yeah, I I can imagine then that 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 would be extended, uh, and there would be big money involved. For example, let's say I was a multi-billionaire and I was contemplating launching some giant business venture, um, there would be direct application there as absolutely. well. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and and it's. And I'm glad you pointed that out because one of the things, as I said, that I'm hoping that to attract is the uh, non-government, you know, sector of the population to be interested. And I had mentioned that our, we actually have gotten an initial investment to our project from a man who is both uh, an investor and a composer. Is um, and I know he does, and my my mentioning him because he's mentioned in the book. But he, his, his father is a very famous composer, was a music arranger for Henry Mancini. And he, was, he has uh, uh, said all that he's interested in is, is he's excited about the possibility. And uh, he just wants to be a part of it. And, uh, and that's the sort of funding that I want to accept. And as I said, that funding does not come to me. That's another important thing to mention is the fact that it goes to a foundation that just dispenses the money as we need it for our research. So this is not one something that's uh, you know uh, that I can use to go to Acapulco or something like that. You know? All right, I have uh, absolutely dominated your time. So let me turn it over to the uh, callers. There are many, many of them. Chris in Illinois, you're on the air with Professor Mallet. Uh, yes, my question. Um, you mentioned the black hole and how the gravity you know, for time travel. Well, it stems back to a, a show they had a week and a half ago where they had an astronomer and an astrobiologist on there, I believe he was. And he said that uh, many black holes were created all the time in the upper atmosphere by something colliding, and that scientists were trying to create many black holes, but they disintegrated very quickly. If they could create one, and be able to sustain it, would that be a plausible idea to do that and make it rotate around? Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting question. Right. The, the problem is, is that the notion of being able to create these, I mean, that is very, uh, if you could the theoretically create them and could control them and you could get down to that region, and you pointed out, and it's a very important point, that they would have to also be rotating black holes in order to do that. Then you might be able to do that. The, the question is, is that would you be able to create them? We don't know that they're being actually created in the upper atmosphere. We don't. We haven't seen any evidence of them being created anywhere at this point. But the thing is, is that if one could create them and one could harness them, then one might be able to use them for that particular purpose. But you have to realize that these black holes, these so-called mini black holes that you're talking about, are um, they were predicted by Stephen Hawking. They radiate, so they're not stable. They actually uh, evaporate. So you would have to find a way of actually stabilizing them. And that, according to uh, Hawking's theory, that by their very nature, they don't want to be stable. They actually want to disintegrate. So, Professor, um, 
This is a good question for you. They are on the verge, I think, uh, perhaps at CERN, of creating a black hole. Now, how much, if any, danger is there in the creation of a black hole? There's a lot of danger. <laughs> I mean, uh-huh. for, for one thing, if you create a black hole, a black hole uh, wants to uh, pull things into it. Now, the type of black hole they're talking about presumably would be one of these uh, uh, Hawking uh, microscopic black holes, which Thanks. radiate energy out. And uh, once you create them, the question is, is that what they would, would they explode and what type of you know, radiation you would get out of them? Uh, that's something that we really don't know at all. And that's not even something that's predicted accurately by Hawking's theory. So it's not clear exactly what would happen if one were able to, uh, to create it in a laboratory situation. But there is there is a fair amount of danger. There is a fair amount of danger. A lot of controversy about that. It's interesting to hear. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Professor Mallet. Uh, Bob, I think, in San Fran. Yes, uh, Professor. I was wondering, you're worried about the uh, uh, funding for it. Is there any way or possibility that you might be able to ask Warren Buffett? Well, the thing is, is that uh, it, for me, it would be one of these situations that... Uh, if he wanted to contact me, I mean, I, I you know, uh, the notion of, of actually, you know, sending uh, my contract out to uh, uh, Bill Gates and everything. I mean, you know, that these people probably get these things from people all of the time. I mean, I want people to realize that, you know, what I'm doing is very, very serious. Oh, and yes. I have a web page that's set up that they can contact me, and I would give them the information, the details. What, what, what is that website, please? Okay, it's www.physics.ucon, and that's spelled U-C-O-N-N. Okay, it's short for University of Connecticut. Right. .ucon.edu. So it's www.physics.ucon, U-C-O-N-N, .edu. And... That web page has been, I've had it designed by a professional uh, web designer who's done a beautiful job of it, and it talks about not only my work in detail, uh, it talks about the funding, and, um, and also it talks about my book as well. And, oh, uh, and incidentally, as I said once again, uh, we can't go into a lot of the details here, but I think that if you, you know, look at the book, you'll find uh, more information as well. But please visit my web page, and this is what I would hope that investors would do, uh, because it, it would give them, uh, it would tell them about the scientific papers, the papers, the referee papers, and everything, and mm-hmm. give them the information that they would need. All right, um, going a little north of me to South Korea, Alan, you're on with Professor Mallet. Hello, Professor, and hello, Mr. Bell. Hello. Hi. Yeah, hi. I got a question for you. Sure. Actually, I got your book, and I used time travel to get it myself. What I did, I saw in the uh, papers that uh, you were going to write a book, and then mm-hmm. I did uh, went to a website called Future Me, mm-hmm. and I sent an email to myself into the future <laughs> <laughs> and uh, told uh, check Amazon.com to see if this book is available, and lo and behold, it is, and I have it on my hand right now, and I've been reading it all day long. Oh, so that brings up a question I got. <clears throat> You're talking about, before in the book, you were talking about the de Sitter universe? Yes, that's right. Okay, the uh, de Sitter space affects super space. So if super space affects de Sitter, that was like in your book, you talked about uh, manifest uh, covariance. Right. Could that explain like dark matter or like what? 90%? In other words, there's other universes affecting this universe and we're feeling the gravitational effects of them? Well, now you bring up a good point because the uh, let me explain you know to the audience um, what the gentleman is talking about the so-called the sitter universe is the representation of our expanding universe. Our we know that our universe is expanding. I mean, this is we see the evidence of this, and one of the solutions of Einstein's equations that was discovered by a physicist by the name of the sitter. Uh, actually gives us a representation of an expanding universe. It would look like uh, a balloon in which if you painted dots on the balloon and those white dots represented galaxies and you blow up the balloon, the dots would expand away from each other on the balloon. And the de Sitter solution of Einstein's equations represents that expanding universe. Now, 
there's a term in there that is called the cosmological constant. This is some as a very controversial term, even for Einstein. But this term represents the possibility of dark energy. So you are you are right on that. The notion some people have in our time is that this uh, a portion of what we of what makes up the universe may be the so-called dark energy, um, not the dark matter, but dark energy. So yes, the Dissider universe, uh, or at least the so-called uh, cosmological term associated with that could represent a p- portion of what we call dark energy in our universe. Okay, Colin? Yes, sir. One more question, and I'll take the answer off the air. If you pumped enough energy into, like, your time machine, mm-hmm. did you make it into, like, a, a black hole generator? Well, I'll take it off the air. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> you're, you're right that if you, if you put too much energy in too small a region, then it's a possibility that you would be creating a black hole. Here, you would actually have to regulate that, and you, would you, and according to the equations, in any case, you should be able to control the amount of energy so that you wouldn't create a black hole. But anytime you have a concentrated amount of energy in uh, any particular region of space, there's always that possibility. And in fact, that's the sort of thing that was briefly mentioned about CERN's uh, experiments. It's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a collider in a sense, isn't it? Uh, well, in the sense of what I'm doing, you have, you know, these four intersecting beams, but they're, they're intersecting in a way that they create um, an effective circulating beam of light. So right. uh, they're not, if you want, you could, I think, of the, I guess the intersecting beams are sort of colliding with each other, but they, they don't uh, collide. They sort of just intersect with each other, and you're interested in the region in which they're not intersecting, uh, in that little area between the uh, inter- uh, intersecting light beams, and that's the area where space should be being twisted and time being twisted. Um, wild card line in Florida. Philip, you're on the air with uh, Professor Mallet. Uh, good morning. I just have two brief questions. Um, one is, um, is, it, is there any more likelihood of either the past or the future being more accessible hypothetically because the past has already happened might it be a little easier to go to the you know to the past than the future as a theory and then one of the brief question after that okay all right, uh, right. i tell you what we're, we're, before you answer uh, either one of them uh, we're going to have to take a break so okay. professor and caller Hold tight right there. Um, I think uh, in the past, it's always been thought that it would be easier to go to the future than the past. But we'll find out more of that after the break. Um, when, you know what? We do have the time. Professor, uh, let's tackle that one. Um, okay, right. Well, Art, I mean, the thing is, is that what you, the statement you made is correct. I mean, in other words, it actually is easier to go into the future. Um, and in fact, you know, we were talking about the special theory of relativity, where right. you can use a right. fast rocket. That actually means that's something that we already have been able to do in the laboratory. We actually have been able to move into the future, short amounts, but we've been able to do it. Going into the past has been something much more difficult. But once again, uh, you might say that the type of thing that you need to do is to fix the past. And what I mean by fix the past is that by creating a, a machine that uh, today, for example, it actually isolates a piece of the past so that you can come back to it. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that's easy to do. But you can use Einstein's general theory of relativity and the fact that gravitational fields can uh, can be manipulated to manipulate time to create that region that would allow you to go back into the past. So it's easier to go into the future than it is to go into the past. That's what I thought. Caller, pose your second question. We'll get that after the break. Caller? Yes. Um, yeah. and one, one quick question. Um, is it uh, in your heart, do you feel that you will be able to um, actualize this, see this in your lifetime at a gut level? Will you do this in your lifetime? Or are you starting something that you hope will be finished by somebody else? All right, there you go. Um, yeah, I, okay. <laughs> no, go ahead. I, oh, go yeah, ahead and no, answer it. It's a fast answer. Yeah, I, I do believe I'll be able to see sending information in subatomic particles, but not human beings in my lifetime. But I do oh. believe it will happen in the 21st century with wow. humans. 
Okay. All right, Professor, hold it right there. Professor Ron Mallet is my guest from Manila in the Philippines. I'm Art Bell. Even if uh, what the professor is talking about, the, um, the time travel of information is achieved in his lifetime, the repercussions of that would be uh, incalculable. It absolutely could not be calculated. Think about it a little bit. You could find out ahead of time whether a project you had in mind would succeed, become a mega corporation, or flop. You could save your money. And that's only the beginning of the application. So if only that much came true in the professor's lifetime, <laughs> he'd own the world, wouldn't he? Professor Ron Mallet is my guest. Uh, it's your turn with the professor, and we'll be right back. Once again, Professor uh, Ron Mallet. Professor, actually, I had heard of your work some years ago, and um, I tried to get you on the air some years ago, and I guess it was premature, and uh, you weren't ready for it. I wonder if you recall the overture. Yes, I do, as a matter of fact, and I appreciated it. It's just that I was in the midst of, of writing uh, doing the research actually on the second half of the work because the first half we had been involved with showing the space twisting and I was still trying to demonstrate the time twisting and which I have now it succeeded and it's been published and also I was working on this book which I had wanted to uh, to have a chance to to reach the public uh, you know I, one thing I'd, I'd like to mention I'm kind of proud of is that Publishers Weekly mentions that the book is for the general public and expi aspiring young scientists so I, I do hope that, uh, you know, the general public does, you know, become interested in reading it. How young is this sign? How, how young are you now? How young am I now? <laughs> I'm 61 years old. You're 61? Oh, you have me beat by a year. So that, how about that? Um, so when you say you're going to achieve perhaps uh, information transfer in time in your lifetime, that's uh, going to be in the next couple of decades, eh? You got it. All that's right. Fine. Back to the lines we go. Uh, Tony on the wild card line in Cleveland, Ohio. You're on the air with Professor Mallet. Hey, Professor Mallet. Um, I'm going to make this quick. Um, actually, I was just wondering, um, with your theory of traveling to uh, alternate universes in time, um, how would you um, deal with the fact that when you get there that there's two of you and, um, you know, you couldn't use your Social Security number, you wouldn't have an ID? <laughs> Wouldn't be able to get a job, you know. How would you deal with that? I mean, because there can't be two duplicate social security numbers and everything. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a practical and interesting question, actually. Well, as a matter of fact, you would. I mean, as I said, <clears throat> I don't think it's something that someone would engage in lightly, and you would have to have given it a lot of forethought, and you would have to decide uh, that you were going to be making a lot of sacrifices by doing it. But for me, as I said, it would. If I were to do it, it would be for not something light. It would be for the reason that I mentioned, uh, to try to prevent an assassination of someone like, uh, you know, Martin Luther King or to see my father or something. And I would be willing to sacrifice uh, and take the chance that in the new universe I would have to see how I would have to fend for myself. Uh, but yes, someone who is doing that, it is not something that you would engage in routinely because, yes, your entire life would be altered and you would have to live with those consequences. So I couldn't agree with you more. Professor, would there theoretically be a way to calibrate it carefully enough so that you could, um, so that you could pick the time? Oh, yes. I mean, you could, you could actually pick the time that you're going back, but because you're, you're moving in space as well as moving in time. And so you can actually calibrate... Uh, as I said, if you turn the device on for 10 years, you could decide whether you want to come back two years, five years, eight years, up to 10 years. So, yes, that can be done. Got it. Uh, east of the Rockies, Joan in Washington, D.C., you're on the air with uh, the professor. Hello. Okay, all right. Just want to say one thing before I ask the question. My deceased husband was an engineer at Raytheon, and I found a card among his papers that said he was 
a little card that said that he was present at the Apollo 11 moon landing. Just wanted to let you know oh. and let the audience know. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a wow. Go ahead. Yeah. Now my question is, um, everybody has been saying that time has been just go whizzing by lately. The one year has been going, and there's another year. So we just had Christmas. Now it's a year again. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think that time could have been manipulated or can be manipulated, the atomic clocks, to make time go faster? <laughs> Well, the thing I'll, is, I'll let you answer, Professor, but I, I have my own answer for that. <laughs> right. The thing is, is that that uh, what you're talking about is psychological time, and yes. uh, I mean it's it's known that uh, you know our, our just the pace of our life. I mean, you remember when, and, and all of us have had this effect. When you were a child, uh, a day seems you know like forever, and as an adult, you know it seems like a minute. I mean, the thing is, is that it's the amount of activity. It's, it's also physiological. I mean, when I say psychological, it's also physiological. But, uh, you know, it has to do with, with what is going on and the amount of, of, of what's happening to us in our life. That psychological time is not the same thing as the uh, time of, of physics that I'm talking about, which is, a, which is not a time that is affected by, you know, our psychological behavior. It's a time that governs us. And it's something that passes for all of us, independent of our, our, of our psychological um, feelings. Okay? Well, the way I always heard it explained, Professor, that I really liked is, you know, when you're three years old, one year represents uh, a third of your life. Now, uh, you're 61, I'm 60. So, um, obviously, it, it represents, uh, you know, a day is just for us. Uh, but as you mentioned, when you're three years old, a day is just simply forever. So I think that answer is why we all feel like time is speeding up right. as we get older. In fact, uh, in, a, in a good sense, it is. Uh, let's go to uh, Charles, I think, uh, in Marietta, Georgia. You're on the air. Uh, hey, Art, I'm a big fan. I just started listening. But uh, anyway, uh, my question is for the professor. Um, I'm just curious, what possible benefit could there be of um of uh of, of you know not sh of sharing it with the world if you know i mean in this age of maybe you addressed this earlier but i don't i, I miss the uh i don't understand why you know what's the benefit of sharing this with the world uh if obviously you're saying you know information will be able to be sent in this lifetime so what happens if i mean you know arabs get a hold of this or you know i mean <laughs> i just don't understand the the benefit you say you say Homeland Security or whatever came to you and said, we want, we'll want we give you as much money as you want. And you say, no, I want to publish my results to the rest of the world. I don't, I don't understand what benefit is there for that. Well, the, the, yes, I did, in fact, address this because the fact that just because we don't share information doesn't mean that the information isn't going to get out there anyway. Um, the thing is, is that what I feel that is necessary is for, I mean, I'm, you know, in a free society, and I believe, I mean, to give you a simple example, I mean, uh, you were very well aware that uh, the airplane uh, that was discovered by the Wrights in 1903 uh, can be used for terrorist activities. So does that mean that when the Wrights had invented it, they should have just simply said, no, we're not going to share this with the public. All we're going to do is to just keep this, uh, you know, a secret with a small group so that eventually terrorists won't be able to use this. Um, you see what I'm getting at. In other words, you can't do that. And besides that, someone else somewhere will do it, invent it anyway. The point is, is that by, we're in a free society and we should share the information. And I don't say that it shouldn't be regulated. In fact, I want to emphasize again very strongly that I feel that any new technology should be regulated, and, and more important the technology, the more important it is to have it regulated. And so I don't mean that this should not be have regulation and be controlled. But what I'm saying is, is that I do not believe that a cloak of secret should be put over it as though it's not going to get out there in the world anyway because we're afraid that someone might use it and abuse it. No, I'm as with that. all things, let's just be first. Uh, right. West of the Rockies, uh, Vic in Carlsbad, California, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Great show. Uh, Professor Mallet, uh, when the time traveler goes back into the past 
and in essence creates a new universe, a parallel universe, wouldn't that violate the law of conservation of mass? You're doubling the mass? Of no. The you, no, you have to realize that, that when we're talking about creating this new universe, it's actually, there's this mathematical thing, it's called superspace. You're not actually uh, using up the energy of one universe to create the other universe. These are actually self-contained, parallel, separate universes that don't use up uh, energy and matter from each other. So there, there's not a principle of conservation of energy that's involved in this because you're not using the energy of the one universe to create the universe, the other universe. But if you have two universes, don't you have double the mass, or, or is that you right? have you have double it, not but not in the same universe. You, you see what I'm getting at? In other words. You, what you're saying is so if you were creating this universe in the other universe, but you're not. These are two separate universes, and they have their own energy conservation associated with each other, and they're not overlapping with each other. If they were in the same universe, then when mm -hmm. you created the new universe, you would, in fact, be creating additional energy, but you're now not. In, in theory, could you go back to the age of dinosaurs, or is it all, uh, you know, how far back in time could you go? You can only go back to the time that you turned the mach that the machine was turned on. In other words, if it's turned on today and you leave it on for a hundred years, you could come back fifty years, twenty-five, all the way back up to this point. But you could not go earlier than that. Which um, also, uh, Vic, answers why there are no time travelers here and now, and there will not be until it is invented. Thank right. you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you, Vic, and uh, take care. Oh, boy. Uh, so many people want to talk to you. Uh, I guess we'll make it uh, the fourth wild card line and Dave in Alabama. Hello there. This is Dave. And, uh, Dr. Mallet, if we take a amoeba strip, a one-sided strip of paper, and draw a line down the center, it meets up with itself because right. there's only one side. Now, if we wanted to uh, travel to a point on the opposite side, so to speak, we have the option of traveling down the line or simply punching through the paper, right. uh, punching a hole. My question is it possible that the configuration of the twist that you're going to try to impart to space could be manipulated in such a way to provide a punch-through point or a sweet spot, if you will, and I'll listen off air. Yeah, that's possible if you, if you actually set it up the configuration of lasers in a way that could create that. It's a possibility that you could create that kind of a, of a twist. <laughs> All right, Lawrence, uh, Billings, Montana, you're on the air with Professor Mallet. Outstanding show, Art. I'm honored to meet you online. And, uh, Professor, something strange happened to me the other night, and I was hoping you could explain it to me. My nephew and I were driving in my Lumina near my residence. We passed 9th Street West. The clock said 906, and it was a very, very heavy fog. It was very in unusually heavy fog and at that point in time we look up at the street sign it said 25th street west and the clock still said 906 as if we went through some kind of temporal time shift all right actually actually that's a, a really interesting question professor is it possible that through some natural quirk some natural um process that we don't understand uh, forces come together that do occasionally allow uh, either peaks into other times or little time slips that occur for reasons that we just, we, we don't know. Right. That's a possibility. I mean, the thing is, is that I'm not sure whether this particular circumstance was that, but I mean, I, but right. the thing is, is that, um, yes, because you remember that I said that this is a gravitational phenomena, and so if a configuration of matter, you know, happened, uh, somehow that would actually cause a warping of space-time in a particular region. And in fact, this whole notion that people have of, of the possibility of wormholes in space is just an example of that. If, if so, it, yes, it's, it's possible that one might have um, energy and uh, matter configurations that occur as a natural consequence of nature that mm -hmm. might produce uh, that type of, uh, of distortion. Yes, that's a possibility. Exactly. Uh, first time caller line, uh, Darren, I think, South Carolina. You're on the air with Professor Mallet. Yes, sir. How you doing, Mr. Mallet? How you doing, Mr. Bell? Fine. I'm very excited to be to be talking to you guys. Uh, thank yeah. you. Are you there? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You. Go ahead. Okay. Um, 
I have a question about um, going forward in time or backwards in time, but I would like to make a statement here. Um, a friend of mine in Arizona was actually in the process of building a time machine, and and he's now gone, disappeared. <laughs> and I have his papers. Hmm. And his papers lead me to believe I've been trying to decipher them for seven years now, and me and a partner of mine, we're working on building our own, and we're fully funded by ourselves. And his papers seem to show that at different points in time, we're at different frequencies, so it doesn't have an effect. So we don't have an effect as a paradox per se, and that we can't affect the past, but we can affect the future, but only by knowledge of what we bring back with us. And and also um, that using using lasers with non-reflectors with a magnetic field around it by by adjusting the the uh, spin of the magnets, you create the vortex through which nuclear forces impose on the photons of the light by the magnetic motion is what determines whether it's positive force or negative force, right spin or left spin, determines whether you go forward or backwards in time. Okay, it sounds like you're reading from the papers, is that correct? I am. Uh, okay. Reading from uh, my notes I've, I've taken from the papers, and also on, on that same knowledge right there that, um, let's see that, Okay, well, listen, we're so short on time, we're not going to be able to proceed with this. But again, it, it kind of brings up uh, another point. That is, Professor, that uh, we cannot have absolute knowledge that somebody else has not come up with a practical means to move in time. It, it may have been done, and we would not have knowledge of it, 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 it correct? Well, yeah, but the, the thing is, is that, once again, uh, I think it's important to, to realize that if they did... It would have to be something that it, the, one of the reasons why I take what I'm doing seriously as well as my colleagues is based on Einstein's theory of relativity. And I think that if it has been done, it would have to have been done on that basis. And, uh, of course, it's possible that it could have been done somewhere. Uh, but the question is, is that as a scientist, I would like to see the evidence of it having happened. Of course. Uh, first time caller, wild card line rather, Marlon in Ohio. You're on the air with Professor Mallet. Not a lot of time. Hi. Yeah, fantastic. I wanted to ask this one question. If we are moving through time, we're moving together at the same speed of time, so we're all moving relative together. But if you have a time machine, aren't you actually moving sideways in time since you're leaving this universe and going to another universe? And if there's going to be benefit in time travel, don't you need a collaborator from another universe to conspire with? Oh, okay. Uh, no. Uh, well, it, it, well, okay, let's, uh, let's take your first question, okay? The thing is, is that as far as uh, you're actually disconnecting your time stream from everyone else, it's not that you're going sideways so much as you're disconnecting by either going faster or being in a different gravitational field, okay? Uh, that's the answer first. The second is, is that, in a sense, you might say it would be an unintended collaboration, and it's a good point, because if you're going to this other universe, a time machine in that universe would have to have been turned on so that you are able to be there in that machine. So absolutely, in a sense, you would have to have had an unintended collaborator in the universe you're going to, because if there's no machine there, you're not going to end up in that universe. Professor, we're out of time. What uh, out of time? What a wonderful program this has been. Guarantee we'll do it again. Your book is Time Traveler. It's just hitting the shelves. Although we talked, to somebody's already got it. So anybody who was fascinated with tonight's program should immediately go out and buy your book, Time Traveler. Professor, I just cannot thank you enough for finally being here with me tonight. Well, thank you very much, Art. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Oh, huh, what a pleasure it's been. Good night, my friend. Well, good night to you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Uh, it's been a wonderful three-day weekend for me. Uh, thank you very much, George, for allowing me to fill in for you uh, on Friday night. Everybody else, have a wonderful week ahead, and I will see you next weekend. So from the Philippine Islands, Manila, the big city in the Philippines, I'm Art Bell.